Property Graph Query Language, also known as PGQL, is an open source, SQL-like query language for pattern matching in property graphs. PGQL is part of Oracle Labs' parallel graph analytics engine called PGX, and is part of commercial products in Oracle Big Data Spatial and Graph and other products. To understand what PGQL is good for, let's look at the differences between graphs and relational databases. In a relational database, data is modeled as tables, with relations between some columns in the tables like this. There is a graph here, but you'd have to join the relations back on themselves to see it. The relational model does not make it obvious what latent information is encoded in the relationships between entities in the database. In a graph, on the other hand, the network of relationships is the primary thing. A graph is composed of nodes, which have properties, and edges, which have properties. Labels distinguish what type of data a node or edge represents, and both properties and labels are first-class citizens of PGQL. So why would you want a graph? Well, first, a graph will show you information that is hidden in the relationships within your data, as opposed to the information encoded directly by the data. If that sounds mysterious, we'll have a good, clear example in just a moment. The other reason is that SQL is just not really good at this stuff. You can do graph-like queries in SQL, joining the same query on itself multiple times with constraints so that you don't end up with an explosion of results. But what you have to do to accomplish that is complex, hard to write, and databases tend to be fairly slow at it. While a join clause is nothing to be afraid of in SQL, each join clause does impose a small performance penalty, and those add up. If you are using SQL to do graph analysis, and you want to follow the links between nodes where there might be a chain of 100 nodes, you have to do 100 joins. But more importantly, there is a chicken and egg problem. You don't actually know how many times you need to do the join to walk a complete path without already having walked the complete path. So you have to keep adding join clauses and repeating the query until you get no change in the results since the last time. Now, to be fair, some databases do have syntax to make this stuff easier, but the principle holds that the data access patterns used in graph queries are not the kind of thing relational databases were designed or tuned for. Graphs are not the natural domain of SQL. There are impedance mismatches which are better dealt with using a dedicated language. But, where applicable, your knowledge of SQL will transfer to PGQL. Let's start learning about PGQL with a simple SQL query and how it would look in PGQL in a graph. This is a very simple SQL query that just fetches every appliance purchase in our database. Now let's look at the same query using PGQL and a graph model. As you can see, both queries begin with select star, in our case followed by the keyword where, and the where keyword is followed by a topology constraint. Topology constraints specify a pattern to look for in the graph. In this case, a node with the label customer connected by an edge with the label purchase to a node with the label item where the value of its category property equals appliance. So this topology constraint uses both label and property values to restrict what will be matched. Of course, what we've just done could easily be done in SQL. So let's look at something that can't. This is the family tree of the Romanovs, the ruling family of Russia from the 17th to 20th centuries. Say that we want to find a common ancestor of Tsar Nicholas and Ivan VI. Expressing that in PGQL is straightforward. We model a graph where every node is a person and the edges have the label mother or father. The query we need comes in two parts. The first part is called a regular path query. That's the first line you see. You'll notice the highlighted items, which are anonymous constraints. An anonymous constraint describes a node or edge which must be present to match the pattern, but which we will not actually return in the results, because we aren't interested in intermediate ancestors, just the common ones. And these constraints match the ancestors in between Ivan and Nicholas. In the select statement, we will define a node that we will return, called ancestor. Its first use in the WHERE clause defines it as a person. 
The second use, without the qualification, is a reference to the earlier definition. So the same node must match both occurrences. That is a common ancestor. The clean star, which you may know from SQL, is what tells the query engine to repeatedly apply the has parent pattern as many times as it takes to reach a common ancestor. Now let's actually run this PGQL query in PGX. We will load a graph of the Romanovs. Next, we will run the query that we just discussed. We have a variable named graph for the graph we just loaded. All we have to do is call the query PGQL method on the graph and pass our query. What we are returned is a PGQL result set, similar to an SQL result set. It's tabular data that we can list. When we list it, we see the common ancestors of Ivan and Nicholas. Now, we have a graph that contains mother and father relationships between people, but it does not show the relationship between the couples that had children. There is no edge between parents. But we can easily use PGQL to extract the list of couples with a little more pattern matching. Here is what that looks like. We are matching two nodes, man and woman, using constraints on the value of the property female to determine which is which. We are using an anonymous constraint to match the child, which must have an edge pointing to each parent in order to match. We could also write the query differently, constraining on the labels mother and father on the edges, instead of using the female and male properties of the nodes. And notice the direction of arrows in the query. That determines the edges that are matched. In our graph, children have edges that point to their parents. So one edge points to the mother and the other toward the father, both away from the child. Finally, since some couples had multiple children, and we do not want to list the same couple multiple times, we use group by to aggregate the results. Let's run that query now, the same way we ran the previous one in PGX. Where all of this really becomes useful is in combination with graph analytic algorithms. Say we have an insurance claim. We can model the claim and the parties involved, the insured and the person being paid, any witnesses or passengers, and define their role in the claim by a label on the edge that connects them to the claim. Through a combination of algorithmic analysis and pattern matching, we can find multiple parties who are all associated in different roles with different claims. It's not obvious from looking at the raw data that we're looking at a fraud ring, but that is what we're looking at. The same person doesn't get paid every time, so if you were just looking at who got paid repeatedly, nothing would look amiss. This is an example of latent information hiding within the relationships in the data. What we're looking at right now with the pattern extracted for us looks like it ought to be pretty easy to spot. But consider that a real insurance company's data, just a tiny corner of it, would look more like this. Knowing where to start is half the battle. Graph algorithms are the solution to that problem, and the combination of using graph algorithms to generate properties in a graph, and then using PGQL to pattern match against the results of that, is a very powerful combination. Graph algorithms in general involve walking a graph in some fashion, and leaving notes in the form of properties on graph nodes as you go. Some nodes may be more connected than others and may be visited multiple times. For example, you could imagine the PageRank algorithm, Google's original search algorithm, as walking through a maze of rooms with multiple doors in them. Each door is an edge to another web page, another node in the graph. Each time you visit a room, you drop a pebble from your pocket in the room. At the end, you will sort all the rooms by which ones have the most pebbles in them. That gives you a measure of importance, a sorted list of the most important nodes in the graph, with an interesting definition of importance, because it's not how many connections does this node itself have, but is this node frequently on the way to a lot of other nodes. Those pebbles we dropped become the rank property of the node. There are many graph analysis algorithms. Graph theory is a fascinating and very active area of research. 
Here are some of the algorithms supported by Oracle Labs PGX and the products based on it. The ones with asterisks come in several variations. Graph algorithms generally fall into several categories. Centrality measurement, such as PageRank, finding the most important nodes by some definition of importance. Structural analysis, analyses such as KCOR and onion decomposition tell you about the graph's structure and are useful guides for what further analysis to do. And community and anomaly detection, finding groups of nodes that are related or unusual compared with the rest of the nodes. Going back to our problem of sifting out interesting nodes from a large graph of insurance claims, we find that any of a number of centrality measures will help us find people who are involved in multiple claims. Community detection algorithms can help us find groups like the one we see on screen. And pattern matching using PGQL can help us identify specific patterns that signal something isn't right and help us prune false positives. So let's examine the structure of a PGQL query. It starts with the select keyword, followed by a list of things to return delimited by commas. The output of a PGQL query is very similar to an SQL result set. The list of things to return are typically properties or attributes of nodes or edges that our query will select. The name, in this case friend, of one of the nodes that we will return is going to be defined in the constraint that selects it. So friend doesn't mean anything yet, but it's going to once we finish writing the query. Some attributes of a node, such as the ID, are defined for any node in any graph. These are intrinsic to being a graph node or edge, and are indicated with parentheses to differentiate them from properties that are part of the data. The WHERE keyword indicates the start of constraints that will restrict what nodes and edges are matched. There are two kinds of PGQL constraints, value constraints, which are just like SQL, and topology constraints, which describe a path through the graph. Topology constraints in the abstract look a little bit like ASCII art. Parentheses denote nodes, square brackets denote edges. The square brackets are surrounded by hyphens and a greater than or less than sign to indicate the direction of the edge, because usually graphs are directed. In an undirected graph, or if you don't care about the direction of edges, you can simply omit the angle brackets. It is not uncommon in a constraint to have some parentheses or brackets which are empty, indicating simply that an edge must be present between two nodes, or a node must be present between two edges, but that node or edge isn't actually going to be returned as part of the results. These are the anonymous constraints we discussed earlier. So a topological constraint is simply a list of nodes and edges that need to be matched, which can also constrain against property or label values. The greater than or less than sign may be on either end of the edge to indicate what direction it points. If the node or edge is going to be referenced elsewhere in the query or in the list of results, then it needs a name, which is the first item inside the parentheses or brackets. As we have seen, labels can be used on nodes or edges to indicate their type. A colon following the name allows you to constrain that the node or edge must have a particular label. You can also specify that a particular property of a node or edge must be or must not be a particular value, and in the case of numeric properties, comparison operators are supported, just as in SQL. Say we were analyzing a social network, we could select all of the people who have a friend that has another friend. This, of course, wouldn't be terribly interesting by itself and would return a huge number of results. So let's constrain it further. We might look for people who only have two friends by using the intrinsic attribute of graph nodes degree that counts the number of edges connected to that node. More practically, we might constrain it to look for specific people such as mutual friends of Alice and Bob. We've simply added inline constraints on the name property for nodes P1 and P2. To further constrain it, we can add a constraint that the friend must be older than Alice. And of course, we can add an additional constraint that the friend must also be older than Bob. And just as in SQL, we can then sort the results. So there are two kinds of value constraints in PGQL. There are inline constraints, which can only reference the node or edge that they are describing. And there are external constraints, which are offset by commas and can reference multiple named match elements from the query. 
If you need to constrain against values from more than one potentially matching node or edge, then you need to use an external constraint offset by commas. Inline constraints inside a topology constraint can only refer to properties or labels of the potential match. So let's take a very quick look at PGQL in action using PGX from Oracle Labs. We're simply going to use the shell interface on the command line and load a graph of the characters from Game of Thrones from a local file and create an undirected version of the graph. We can take a quick look at the number of nodes and edges in our graph, and then we can use the built-in analyst to run a built-in graph algorithm, in this case, eigenvector centrality, which is a measure of centrality somewhat like page rank and other ways of finding important graph nodes. This adds a property named eigenvector to every node in the graph. We can then use PGQL to query the graph, that gets us a PGQL result set, which is a tabular result set similar to those in SQL, and we can print the results. To wrap things up, PGQL and graph analysis algorithms combine to create a powerful way to get insights about your data that are simply not possible using traditional tools. Here are several ways you can try PGQL today. Thanks for listening, and happy graphing.